Award 2013 and was ranked number nine of Young Architects to Follow in 2013. His work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2010, at the Emotion in Architecture at Kunstler Haus Salzburg and the Best of Exhibition in Innsbruck and Vienna. Yes, the wait is finally over. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together to welcome Chris Pratt. Hello? Yeah? Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, before I start, I have to say that usually uh, those architectural conventions are pretty boring. Um, but I think you guys uh, really know how to put some enthusiasm uh, into architecture. So that's, that's very nice to see. Okay, um, hello, I'm Chris, uh, I'm an architect from Austria, and I just turned four years old as an architect. Um, we founded our studio in 2014, um, and as a four-year-old, we slowly developed how we can walk on our own feet, and we slowly start to speak our own architectural language. And also, as a, like a four-year-old, um, we have still this necessary naivety and positivity in the way that uh, we take on projects where we not necessarily ask, um, is it profitable? But our questions are, uh, is it possible? Um, and uh, as an architectural toddler, um, I'm not an expert in anything. You will see that our uh, work is quite uh, a big range, um, and I will talk uh, uh, mainly about how we steer uh, in this architectural world um, as a toddler. So as a real toddler, um, I was growing up like this. Um, could, you, could you shrink the <coughs> image a bit? So what you see here is a Ferrari. Um, it's not a real one. My father was, was a carpenter. Um, and he built this Ferrari for me when I was young. Uh, this Ferrari, I drove with it more than 100 kilometers per hour, and I accidentally killed two chickens. Um, oh, that's here. Um, but uh, <clears throat> this is also a pretty good, uh, whoever uh, of you is, is in architecture, is a pretty good analogy that before I studied architecture, um, I had a Ferrari um, and I had hair. Um, but after, uh, now in the business, I don't have a Ferrari and I don't have any hair anymore. Um, so uh, whoever is in architecture of you uh, to make some money, I think you have to rethink that. Um, in, real, uh, in real world, I'm 34 years old now, and that is a little bit of a weird age for an architect because um, I'm 20 years uh, too young to be any important, um, but I'm also 10 years too old to study anything else. So I am a young architect, which is in itself a little bit of a contrast, because usually you get very good as an architect between 50 in your 60s or in your 70s. But a young architect is a bit of a weird place um, to be in. On the other hand, it is also very exciting to be an architect and young, because we are living in times where we have um, a lot of change. I think uh, in all of our world, there is a lot of change going on in the moment. And as architects, I think we have a very unique skill set to steer um, the world through this change. I think we are, uh, we combine, based on our skill sets, we combine business and creativity. Um, we are a little bit like strategic dreamers. Uh, and I think that is a very important skill set uh, for a lot of industries that, that are uh, in transformation, especially in the construction business. Um, and I think because of our skill set, we should start um, to first uh, change the construction business because it has the most impact on our natural surrounding, um, the most negative impact on, on our environment, um, so it would be a pretty good place to start there. And I will elaborate on this thought a little bit uh, later on. Um, to uh, talk a little bit about what is about to change, um, I want to uh, go through a project in general in, in phases. I think every project can be, um, can be divided into five phases. So it starts with 
the starting of a project. And this is a very beautiful thought, I think, I think, in architecture, that every project ever done started always the same way. It started with a pen um, and an em empty paper. So the possibilities by then are still endless. And I think we, ha we heard a very good uh, talk of Frank yesterday um, about, about this part. And I think that is really beautiful because it connects us uh, in the present to all the history and all the past of, of builders um, uh, who, who, who did our craft. The second part is the designing of the building, and I think there is a lot of change happening at the moment and in the last decade already. I think the tools we have now for architecture um, are very broad and very new, and that puts a lot of uh, um, benefits towards you, towards the young architects, towards the architectural toddlers, because we should grow up with that, and we should learn that very early on, because then we have an advantage later on in the jobs. Um, but the third part is building a building. And also here, there is uh, a lot of change happening at the moment. New technology is coming in. New materials is coming in. Rapid prototyping, CNC milling, 3D printing. And the benefit of that is that um, the, the designing of a building and the building of a building move much closer together. And we as architects are much closer than uh, to the, the building, uh, to, to, the, to the construction of a building. The third part is how we use a building, and I think there needs to be a lot of change in the future, um, and I will elaborate my talk a lot uh, about this topic. And the fifth one is the deconstruction of a, of a building. I think this is a very undervalued point um, in, in our craft that we don't think of how are we actually deconstructing our architecture. Because we as human beings, we have a limited lifespan, but so do building. And I think we cannot afford anymore to bury uh, very valuable resources uh, under buildings. Um, and I think this, this change needs to come um, because the current way of how we construct our buildings is uh, very insufficient. Um, our high-rises are mainly islands in the city. They consume a lot, uh, but they don't give anything back. Um, they are basically cores with very expensive real estate around it. And if this is our sense of architecture, I think that there is something wrong to it. Um, I think an, 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 a building needs to be more connected to an urban fabric. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> because uh, I lived a long time in Beijing, and I know the consequences what, uh, what pollution, for example, have. Um, the, at the moment, current construction industry is the biggest polluter in the whole world. Um, we consume, uh, the construction industry consumes uh, more than 50% uh, of all the world energy and produces more than 40% uh, of all the greenhouse gases. Um, and we are part of this. We are the biggest polluter uh, on this earth. So I think it is, it is on us young architects to somehow rethink what architecture can be, what construction can be. Um, because this one cannot be the solution of how we bring uh, nature back into our cities. Um, I asked a couple of, uh, a couple of days ago um, on, on Instagram, like, what would you like to hear uh, when I give a lecture uh, in Kerala and in Delhi? Um, and uh, a lot of you guys responded. Uh, I got a couple of hundred uh, uh, messages. Um, how to start your own practice. I will talk a little bit about this today. Um, your journey so far will be also covered. Um, I also will show some projects I've never published before. Um, some of them also in India. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what is the what is the um, what is the, the the task for a future generation of, of architects? We will talk about this. Um, architecture and food will be a big topic in my talk today. Um, modular architecture, natural architecture will be covered. Um, the tools we are using, I will talk a little bit about that. Um, Indian projects will be in there. Um, uh, how to get, how to clear your mind. We are all very busy people, um, so how to clear your mind is a, is a very important uh, part in architecture. I will also elaborate on this one. Um, yes, afterwards. And uh, I don't know if it's online, but uh, in case you guys have a handy, you can also put it online if you want. 
Um, so I was born on the 1st of October, uh, which gives me a very bad ranking, um, one out of 10. Um, but uh, I'm a Libra. I don't believe in, in, in uh, horoscopes, uh, but, I, but there is one true thing to that, that um, I need balance in my life. Um, after five years in Beijing, where we founded our office, um, I, uh, we worked ourselves a lot into a burnout because this balance in architecture was missing. And this is a balance of um, that uh, in projects itself, so we keep this balance by always working on two projects at the same time. One is a, is a project that has a client. The other one is a project that is self-initiated. Um, so we don't do a lot of projects anymore. So we try to keep there the balance of a project that deals with restriction. It deals with, uh, with compromises. Um, and the other one where you are free to create something because you feel that this is important for the future. I will cover both of those kind of projects uh, today, sorry. And the second part is um, that I also try to create a balance in my life and in my work, um, that this is also in balance. Uh, I think we are all aware that architecture is not the most healthy job you can get. Um, I actually think that architecture wear black not because of a minimalistic fashion statement. I think they wear black out of an emotional statement. I think we are all very, very sad inside because um, working 15 hours per day um, and uh, being undervalued, um, that can make you dis depressive. But today I actually feel quite positive, so yeah, I wear white. Um, but we tr try to create this balance uh, by moving here. So we moved back to Austria, uh, near where, we, where I come from, my wife and me, and uh, we work and we live there. We live not in a, in a city in Austria, we also don't live in a village in Austria. We move to the mountain. We don't have any neighbors uh, and we, uh, we, do, we, well, some cows are our neighbors, but otherwise than that, uh, we are completely off grid. And that also, um, <clears throat> that also cuts out all the, all the pressure you feel what the city gave me, for example, in Beijing. So this was a very relieving uh, thing for us to do. So when the weather is nice, um, we are mainly on the mountains and do skiing in winter, we go hiking in summer. Um, and actually, if I could talk uh, or give a lecture about this topic, it would be much more interesting. But today, uh, it's about architecture, because the weather, if the weather is not so good, um, we have some time to do some projects. And about this, I'm, I'm talking today. So I gave now a little bit of an introduction of myself, where I'm coming from. Um, how, how we are working, um, and I believe that um, this is also important because architecture is personal. So whatever your lifestyle is, wherever you're working, whatever your mindset is, where you're growing up, um, it, um, it influences of what kind of architects and on what kind of projects. Uh, the hands of this man uh, is, are the hands from, the, uh, from my wife's grandfather. And he's a, a bamboo craftsman. He makes a lot of basket. So I was very early on influenced by the material bamboo. Um, and this project I'm introduced, uh, I introduce now um, is called One with the Birds. It's, it's a bamboo structure which was influenced uh, by the tipis of Native Americans. What I like about this uh, type of architecture is that it is very flexible. So people, they took it with them whenever they heard of buffaloes were traveling further, and all of the joints, they are tied. So that, that doesn't leave any harm on the material or on the site. 
Um, and I like this, this sensible architecture that you treat uh, your natural materials uh, the way that you can reuse them afterwards. So this is our, um, our interpretation of, of this flexible tippy structure. So a bamboo structure that is fully modular, it can be extended to the left, to the right, to front, to the back, and to the top, um, and connects people back to the nature. Um, this is my father. Um, my dad was not just a good carpenter, but he was also a crazy climber. Um, he was famous for that, that he climbed everything without any security. So it was just him and the mountain. Um, so there is no, no rope, no net, no nothing, just him and the mountain. And um, <laughs> Next time I should do a lecture just about my father. <clears throat> um, and uh, so my dad, he experienced our natural environment in a fully three-dimensional way. I think when, when we grew up, we did the same. We were climbing trees, we were uh, in the nature, and we were somehow one with the wildlife. When we get older, though, we are mainly still on the ground and we discover it more in a two-dimensional way. So this project introduces people back to a three-dimensional way in a very natural, uh, in a very natural building typology. So we use uh, bamboo um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a modular structural system um, to get people also to the height. Um, this project is, for example, one of my self-initiated, of our self-initiated projects. Um, so we did a lot of testing. It was a very hands-on approach first, which was a bit weird for me because I'm coming from a school where the computer is heavily used, or was heavily used. So it was a, a very new thing um, to develop uh, natural structures like bamboo. And working with bamboo needs to be a hands-on approach because the material itself is imperfect. So you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, take this into consideration on the computer, because computers are perfect. But doing something imperfect on a computer is much more work. Um, so we took it on our own hands first to initiate the project. Uh, could you also turn these lights a bit down? Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so we funded the project by ourselves, we bought a thousand bamboo canes, and we, we built first a, structural, uh, uh, a structure by ourselves, our own team, because we wanted to see the structural capabilities of bamboo, what is possible, um, where do we need to change the design, um, and so forth. Um, all the joints, what you're seeing in this project, are all binded, so they're all tied together, so there is no metal, no screw used. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and here you see some of the ropes going through and connecting the whole structure uh, to a building. Um, after that, we, d we redeveloped the structure and we made, out of, uh, out of a little uh, structure, we made a, a product design. Um, a product design much rather than an, an architectural business, uh, an architectural building. Um, I, because I don't like the, the business of architecture. I actually hate the business of architecture because it is not scalable. Um, architecture uh, is an unscalable business. So, for example, if you work on a single family house, you maybe have one or two employees who work on this house. But if you get an airport, you hire 100 more people, they build the airport, but it's not, like, it's not scalable. Whereas if you design a product, um, it can be a successful product, like a chair, for example, and then it can be sold a million times. Um, so this is a scalable business. Um, so I, we much rather think about architecture uh, as, a, as a product design, if it's possible, uh, than about, about a building itself. So this product design here is a very small unit. Then uh, with a couple of more bamboo shots, you can build a small uh, yoga studio or garden pavilion. This one is a hotel, a little hotel structure with five rooms um, or community spaces, but all with the, ba with the, with the same structural knot and joints. Um, here you see a little bit how the, how the building is, is building itself up with the layers. So all of it is the same part, the same component, um, just scaled uh, in height. The project is, is now under construction. One structure is already finished. The second one is coming up. Um, this one is in Ecuador uh, on the coast, on the 
uh, on the west coast of Ecuador in Ayampe. Um, and they are building a small hotel with the structure, very community-based. So he invite, because the, um, it is like building up a, a billy shelf from Ikea, the joint is always the same, basically. Um, so it just needs one joint, and you know exactly how to continue it. Um, this is when the, when the building is already a bit taller, um, with the roof and with the, with the pots inside for sleeping. And the second one is coming up in, in Anqi County in, in China. And here we want to make a little bit of a different development, a more ecological development, um, that you plant a bamboo grove, and whenever you take out one cane of bamboo, you have to plant two more trees. So therefore, the, the forest around uh, the development grows, and the development itself uh, also grows. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that bamboo needs to be introduced in, the, in, the, in our capitals, but if we think about that we are, the, the construction industry is the biggest polluter, um, we, I think it is on us that we are thinking about strategies that are more ecological um, that's what we, than what we are having uh, at the moment. Um, the second uh, part I would like to, t uh, what, what, what um, guides our work is the attribute modular. Um, modularity is a very important factor in our work. So the Chinese building history was fun funded with bamboo, especially in the south of China. Um, in Austria, it is wood. So Austrians are very good wood craftsmen. Um, it is therefore no surprise that this, uh, this material where uh, everybody is talking about now, uh, cross-laminated timber, was invented in Austria. It was invented in Austria 30 years ago. And it's basically um, cross-laminated uh, massive wood uh, planks. And um, those, they can be used not just for single-family houses, how Austria used it now for 30 years, but they also can be used in high-rises. So you can finally build a skyscraper in wood. Because of this cross-lamination, the wood doesn't shrink and doesn't expand, which is usually the problem of higher structures uh, with wood. Um, living in a wood building, of course, comes also with other benefits. So, for example, it is four times lighter than concrete. That means that you can build thinner, it is more resistant than to earthquakes because it is lighter. Um, you get more square meters. So it, it has an, uh, it has an um, uh, economical benefit, but also an ecological. So, for example, people who live in wood houses uh, have a lower heart rate. Um, so wood uh, is very, uh, very good uh, uh, to, to use in architecture, but for now there was just the, the, the limit in height, and this material then changes it. For this project I uh, introduced, it's called uh, Toronto Tree Tower. Um, it's a project, uh, well, in Toronto. And uh, it was influenced by, by two projects. One was the, was the, um, the Habitat 67 from Moshe Safdie in Montreal, um, which was, I think, one of the first ones who used prefabricated foxels um, to put into the structure. So the, the process of building was something completely new. He did it in, in concrete, which was far too heavy. I think the, uh, three or four cranes actually crumbled under the weight. And on the other hand, the Bosco Verticale uh, in Milan. And both of them uh, somehow gave this inspiration for the Toronto tree tower. So we use um, also voxels, prefabricated ones, because it is wood, it is much lighter. And they are then prefabricated off-site, delivered to site, and then craned into place. So it is a kind of a new, uh, not, not a new mentality, basically, to, to build, um, but a newly found uh, mentality. Um, and in the end, then, to introduce uh, trees back into the building. <laughs> that the uh, material for the building is basically then growing on the building itself. Um, it's uh, also during the, during the winter when the trees they lose their leaves, uh, there can sunlight come into the apartments. Um, when, when, uh, when it's summer and the, the trees are blossoming, um, it gives a natural uh, sunshade then to the interior spaces. So it's basically a kind of a garden but uh, in the sky. 
And I really like to think of building in wood because um, I like this diagram that a natural resource like our sun um, is giving life to our natural materials. And they then can be processed um, into, with high, um, high tech um, into building planks. And after the life cycle of a building can be reused then and have a second life after the building is demolished. A third topic is cultural. I think cultural is for all of our work a very important topic. Uh, <clears throat> um, Victor Hugo said that, uh, that back then, in ancient history, um, architecture was so important that it defined cultures. So it was language uh, for people. It was language that got um, communicated throughout generations. I think that diminished then a little bit through... Uh, through uh, industrialization, through modernism, um, but it used to be the main dominating art form, building. Um, I think that came down a little bit. But for our practice, this still has a lot of relevance because we are in China uh, on one hand and we are in Europe on the other hand. And both of them, without going too deep now into this, um, have a different heritage where, uh, where buildings are coming from. And I think uh, one of the most interesting part uh, of in our, in our studio is that we can learn from this uh, cross-cultural language. So caves were basically our... So here now I introduced some projects, but I introduced them very quickly because I have a couple of those cultural projects we did in the last, in the last years, in the last four years. Um, the first one is, is, a kind of, is a project that was in, inspired by the cave. Uh, the cave were our first apartments as, as human beings, um, but also our first museums, also our first galleries, and our first artworks uh, were in caves. And uh, this project, uh, in, so the, the arch as a, as a building typology, as a structural typology, is a reinterpretation of the cave itself. It's not just the logo of NASA, um, but also uh, a reinterpretation of, uh, <coughs> of a cave. Um, so sorry for copying your, uh, your logo. Um, so we use this arch as a language. Um, we use it as a normal arch, but also as a cross, uh, as a counter arch. And both of them then uh, give into this interior a sense of a, of a flowing ribbon. But uh, nothing of it is double curved. It's all very easy to, um, uh, it was all very easy to build. Um, actually, it was built from the first sketch uh, to the opening. We just had 31 days. So this 1,000 square meter gallery was basically built in, in about two weeks on site. <laughs> <coughs> I think this applause was now for the 70 construction workers who were actually building it. <laughs> uh, the, second, uh, the, the another project right next door um, belongs to the same company, um, but the same developer, uh, and it's also an art space, but more of a lecture hall. So people should sit there and get inspired after they were in the gallery uh, and then listen to a lecture of the artist, for example. Um, so we, we uh, were contacted again and asked for uh, designing a space where people can get inspired. Um, we, were, we were thinking about Escher drawings, about Dali uh, uh, drawings, and it's basically, again, just uh, a little box we inserted into the space, but with mirrors on all sides, so the arch gets then uh, copied to infinity. And maybe it is then this place of infinity where, where all of our ideas or our creativity um, comes from. And people then sit into the, in the space and are copied a thousand times. I wouldn't want to see myself a thousand times, but uh, <laughs> maybe if with an audience then uh, it works. Um, another project is a little hotel in Beijing. Um, it just opened uh, last year. Um, it is in the Hutong areas, uh, and we used a lot of those Hutongs are now demolished. Uh, we used then the bricks from those Hutong areas uh, to rebuild a massive wall uh, where the cut out of a, of a traditional house basically uh, is cut in. And then also in the interior, there are a lot of those volumes. So you're feeling when you're going through the hotel like you're going through a traditional Hutong village, but in the inside. Um, <clears throat> in the backside, this is me again, uh, before architecture, because I have hair. 
and uh, the wall where all the Mickey Mouse and so is on, um, it's, my, my dad also built my whole children's room. Um, uh, and the wall you see there is actually a, a double wall, and it had another slide inside, it had secret compartments inside, what I found years later. So I grew up in a, in a kid's room that, uh, that offered a lot of curiosity for me. Um, curiosity to, to look into, into things and discover architecture. And I think this, this, this sense of discovering architecture never left me in a way. Um, for this project, it's an it's a apartment, a vacation apartment for a client of us uh, near the skiing slopes in Beijing. Beijing has the Olympic Games in 2022, the Winter Olympics, and this is near the skiing areas. Um, the sense of curiosity for people who visit, um, we also wanted to plan in there. So there are sometimes hidden rooms. Uh, when you go through a corner, um, you find some compartments you can open somewhere, so it is fully discoverable. Um, and the space itself is inspired by an igloo, what you built out of, uh, out of snow. Um, so it is built with a cold, seemingly material, but inside it is very warm. So, for example, all the heating pipes are going through those walls, so when you touch them, they are very haptic and very warm. Um, and then everything is cut with a contrast of wood, so a warm material and a, and a cold material. Um, in the same area, uh, for the Olympic Games, uh, we also uh, were asked to design, together with Arup, uh, with a structural engineer bridge, um, for the Olympic Games, and it uses the culture of the Olympic Games, um, some, something which is also deeply rooted of um, not just the logo itself, uh, but also attributes like openness, like inclusive, um, welcoming people. Um, and we used basically the rings of the Olympic logo to create a structure for this, uh, for this bridge for the Olympic Games. From the side, the bridge looks like three mountains, so three arches. Uh, the, project is, or the bridge is called Sunshine Bridge, which means three mountain bridge. From the top, it's a DNA string, uh, <clears throat> which resembles a little bit also sport, uh, DNA, well, doping, something is there, I guess. Um, and from the front, it's a very inviting gesture. So when you come close to the bridge, it opens up, and you're driving then through the circle uh, across the bridge. A circle in Chinese culture, it has always some, something inviting. You probably all know Chinese gardens, for example. They have an, uh, a circular opening for people inviting them uh, into, their, uh, into their garden. Another uh, cultural project, I'm not sure if I can say cultural, but which was... Um, which was inspired by a local culture, by a local vernacular, if you want, um, is in Tel Aviv. Uh, Tel Aviv um, has, on one hand, those beautiful Mediterranean, Mediterranean architecture with very thick stone walls, very haptic um, arches as cutouts, so typical Mediterranean. Um, and on the other hand, very well-preserved Bauhaus buildings. Um, so if you would like to see Bauhaus buildings, the best way is to go to Tel Aviv. Um, and we somehow merged this two, these, this haptic material on one hand, and, on, and the Bauhaus, uh, the, the Bauhaus um, attributes on the other hand into one high-rise. Um, this is called uh, Tel Aviv Arcades. Again, it uses the arch as a, as a symbol, um, and the counter arch um, to create balconies outside um, and uh, in the setback then uh, there are the, the apartments. There's a look outside of the apartment. <clears throat> Here it's how it's built up. I believe that um, it is an absolute nonsense to build glass towers in the south. I, I'm very much against to build just glass towers in the south because of... Oh, <clears throat> because they overheat uh, very, very easily. Uh, you put a lot of technical equipment in there, and I think we can learn then a lot from vernacular architecture um, that, that gives, for example, a layer on its balcony uh, which shield off direct sunlight um, and makes it a natural ventilation then uh, in, in the building itself. 
Um, the first project I, I talk in India is in, uh, is in Hyderabad. Um, this one was our first project, our second project we did in India, or are doing at the moment in India. And um, I, was, I was always very inspired by, by stairwells. I think, uh, like as a typology, I think those are the most beautiful buildings in the world, um, stairwells. And uh, so this building combines on one hand, or this, this design combines on one hand uh, stairwells, uh, on the other hand water mazes, and transforms both of them into a landscape design uh, in Hyderabad. <coughs> Here's a little close-up. It's, it's, it's for a developer called uh, Pucha Crafted Home in Hyderabad, uh, and it's for a development of one of their developments uh, there. Um, a second project. Uh, is in, in very much inspired by Indian patterns. Uh, I love henna tattoos and okay. <clears throat> I, I could be wrong on this, but my impression is always that, uh, especially in India, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of different creative industries are very much combined by, by the pattern. Um, so whether I, I look at, for example, tattooing, uh, like henna tattoos, or clothing, um, or architecture, it's all it's it's very much rooted, I think, into the into the same uh, methodology. And I really really like that. I think in, in no other culture uh, I find this closeness uh, throughout a lot of different industries. Um, so this is my sketch. It's a bit worse than uh, Mr. Ching's sketch, so that's why I'm also not talking about sketches. Uh, but it, it gives you an idea of what I wanted to create with this building. Um, and a pattern uh, that connects its facade, that connects a kind of a cha chaotic uh, layer of nature on its facade, um, but with uh, architecture then combined. So the pattern and balconies uh, in, in this sense. Um, so this is the pattern we created for, for the facade. It's basically just uh, triangles um, and the building that comes out and in the background of those triangles. From a different perspective, again, the, um, the pattern is opening up. So when you see it a bit more from the side, the building is closing much more. So all of the, of the tops are then covered with uh, green roofs. Here you see a little build-up um, of the project. Um, so on the, on the bottom, uh, it's a hotel. I also should say that. So on the bottom part, there's a large, large parking area. Um, in India, uh, the parking is really enormous, apparently. Um, so had, we had to revise it two times, always double the amount of parking, adds the double amount of parking. Then there's a huge banquet hall uh, in the center. It's a, it's a large lobby, and all the rooms then are on the outside. So when you enter the hotel, it's, uh, it, you come into a very large, quite dark, mysterious uh, lobby. Um, and then uh, once you're looking outside, you're, in, uh, you're in, a, in a massive hotel, though. But with the balcony, it should feel more like a resort, because everybody has still on the balcony um, their own privacy. This one you see again from the street level. When you look towards it, it completely opens up. And from the side, then it closes a bit, uh, a bit further. Uh, it, it closes, and when you look at it from the, from the very side, uh, you basically just see a green wall. Um, I was very uh, inspired by those boulders in Hyderabad. Um, they are really beautiful. Oh, here you see the, the project again from the top. Um, this one was on site for the next project I show. Um, it's, it's two boulders but stacked and you have those big boulders everywhere and I really love them. And the client asked us um, to, design, uh, to design some houses uh, and like some villas. And I like to design villas, I'm okay with that. But he said, yeah, we need 50 villas. And I was quite shocked by that. I mean, I know it a little bit from China. Um, and you sh I saw the same thing in India than I saw in China. When you build villas, actually, it's a house right next to the, to the other one. And there is no difference between this house or the 50th, 50th on, the, on the other side. Um, so this repetitive 
uh, design approach, uh, I was a bit against that. So I was a bit scared about this, and we tried to find some solutions of how we, we can build on plots where 50 are right next to each other and very small, how we can find a strategy that we still create some variety uh, between all the, building, uh, all the houses itself. Um, so uh, inspired by the boulders, um, we, we went uh, more vertical than horizontal. So each house consists of four vertical spaces, all arranged based on Vastu. Um, and if you look at it, there is, you don't really see that there is one really similar than the other one. Uh, because uh, gardens, uh, trees are somehow uh, give the whole master plan a variation then. Um, another <coughs> topic of our office is respon responsive to, uh, to create buildings that somehow respond to, to a certain plaza, to people in a way. Um, I said before when I talked about the bamboo buildings that it has a, a heavy uh, hands-on approach. And for me this was something new because I was coming from, from a university where we were taught in computers a lot. So we tried to Coca, we tried to do a project together with Coca-Cola um, to make aware, people aware of plastic waste. So people could give back their empty Coca-Cola bottles. We collected them um, and they got one filled up cola bottle uh, for free. So like that we collected uh, more than 17,000 cola bottles. Um, and we wanted to make this one an artwork. And this artwork should be like on one hand a little bit like the, like the swoosh of the cola logo. Um, but also like a kind of a, a paper stripe. So I tried with the computer to somehow model a paper stripe. And I think it was like after the fourth day or so where I gave up. I just couldn't do it. Now I think I, I would know how to do it, but back then I had no chance. So I failed miserably. So um, then we said, yeah, why don't we just do a model? Like we did this one in 10 minutes. Um, we gave it to the construction builders. They did this one in the next day. Um, and the next day, then the bottles were on. So, <laughs> I think that, that gives a little bit the impression that sometimes, we, even we, if we have very good skills on a computer, it's sometimes not really helpful to think too much with your computer, but also take a little bit more of a hands-on approach uh, here or there to, uh, it, it, so the, I think the, the, the the fastest line, or the, the fastest line between A and B is not necessarily the, um, the, the shortest line, but the safest line. And I think uh, that also is something we need to, to learn in architecture, that not everything you can do with the computer, you should do with the computer. A responsive project, uh, this one was our first project we, we, we ever got. Uh, it was a competition. We won this competition. Uh, it is in the, in the middle, in the center of China, in a tier two city. Um, and this one was the starting point uh, in 2014 uh, for, our, for our office, basically. Um, it is an entrance gate. So this, this is a normal public plaza in China. I'm not sure if, if uh, some of you have been in China already, but it doesn't matter where you go. If you go uh, on a, in the evening outside, um, you see this in a public plaza. People dance together. Uh, community is still very, uh, 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 very big there. Um, so our design was in between the city and the natural park. Uh, the natural park was a myrtle, myrtle tree garden. Um, so with huge and very old myrtle trees. Some of them were more than 1,000 year old trees. Um, and they, had this, they have these pink uh, flowers uh, on top of them. Um, and we wanted to create a little bit of a transition space between the city on one hand and the nature on the other hand. And this uh, sound wave then uh, was, our, was our main influence for this project, to have the noise of the city somehow fading out and turning slowly into, into nature. Um, I said I'd talk a little bit about, uh, about 
software as well, because uh, although I said before that the hands-on approach is sometimes important, in this project it was very important to be also skilled in com with computers, because we had 700 different fins, they were all different in, in their profile, they were all different in their height, they were all different in their cladding. Um, so uh, we needed to draw 700 different elevations, 700 different sections, and 700 different plans. Um, so be doing things then with the computer is much easier. So I think all of those pack of drawings, it was in the end like a pack like this. Uh, we did basically in two days just with a, uh, with a little script. Um, I don't know. Oh, I don't have the script with me. Um, but all of, they got then all this package. They prefabricated all the fins. Um, the, the na their name tag was already waiting uh, on site, and they installed it. Oh, sorry. Um, all the fins, they are perforated towards the top, so, and there is LED lighting inside the top. Um, and it measures then on the plaza how much movement there is. So if people are there for dancing, it knows, okay, there is some movement going on, so if you would clap now with the drums and so, um, so this one would light very, very brightly. Um, so it meshes with sensor what's going on in the plaza and translates that then into architecture. And this is what I mean then with responsive, that architecture reacts to whatever is happening to, uh, around it, and the people then respond back then to architecture. Another topic of us is flexible, to create flexible spaces. Um, I go also uh, through a couple of projects very quickly in the end, and a, a bit of a longer one. Um, this one is a, a showroom, a workstation, and uh, a think tank for Volkswagen, for the German car brand. Um, they asked us to design their, their office uh, headquarter in, in Beijing, uh, the interior. Um, and uh, we wanted to create a, a very a uh, flexible space that can transform itself to whatever is the need and the demand of the space at the moment. So, for example, um, we, ha we have uh, circular pots. Um, all of them are divided into three parts, and all of those sliding doors can either open or close. And therefore, they can have meeting rooms, they can have showrooms, so they can uh, play this in, 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 in different variations. It's a truly flexible space. <laughs> Another flexible project is a, is a music hall um, in the south of, of China, um, and it also should be as flexible or as, ver ver uh, as much variety as music itself has. Um, and we created this space that the facade can fully open when there is an event happening, or it can fully close when nothing is happening. And the same flexibility also in the interior design. So when it's closed up, you have three different spaces, but if the demand is there, if there is a large concert, for example, that, or an, an exhibition, then it can uh, fold down and more people then are integrated into one large space. Um, a little side project we initiated by ourselves is a little vacation home. Um, it also, you close it up when you're not there, you open it up when you're there, and you turn it uh, and create then 50% uh, more interior space than you have uh, before. Um, we also work together with a, with a company called Bigger Tia, uh, who is producing furniture uh, for interior spaces. Uh, Real estate prices are rising, um, so I think it needs also for the interior um, design strategies of how you can build more function on smaller uh, scales. And you also can bring this sense of flexibility also to our cities, that architecture itself can respond to what is happening in its surrounding. So, for example, this is the museum, uh, the Bauhaus Museum uh, in Germany, in Dessau, and it can react to different kind of things. So, for example, during the winter, it can close up the park because the park during winter is more like a dead land. Um, when there are public painting events or outdoor cinemas, it can uh, turn their public, uh, their, it can rotate their public areas uh, to the right position. 
um, or for public viewing for the Football World Cup when Germany is losing against Austria, um, <laughs> or as a backdrop on music festivals, for example. But that architecture is not something static, that's something um, rigid in the city, but it can interact with its surrounding. And this is also the starting point for this project. It's the first time I'm, uh, I'm showing that project. Um, when uh, I think that flexibility is something extremely important for our generation. Um, I think that our generation is more flexible than the generation of our parents. And I think the next generation will be more flexible um, than us today. So cheap. Air, air, uh, air travel, for example, or the internet is connecting the, the whole world. I was able to open a, an architecture studio uh, in Beijing, for example. Uh, my dad would not have been possible uh, to do that, not because he was all the time climbing on mountains, but because uh, it was just not a thing you did back then. And I think this flexibility of generation, it will go further. And architecture is in no way uh, responding to any of these flexibilities of new generation. Um, the main idea of this, uh, of, this, of this project came when my wife, uh, my wife and me were looking for a house. So my dad, he died like three, four years ago now, um, and we moved back uh, to Austria, my wife and me, to be closer then to my mom. Um, and uh, we were trying to, to look for a house, uh, but we had to think of all of those um, necessary uh, uncertainties in a way. So we had to think, okay, how many children do we want to have? Uh, maybe two. Um, does my mom maybe one day live with us? Um, do we get a dog? Are we working from home? Do we have a home office? How many employees do we want to have? So all of this maximum of space, we already needed to take in consider consideration of, uh, do uh, of doing a house when we bought it. Um, so we thought, wouldn't it be nice if uh, architecture can respond to all of those different life choices you make? Because um, your life is flexible. It changes from one day to the next. So why shouldn't architecture actually uh, respond and adapt to all those changes? So for example, uh, we, we took a look how many square meters each of us needs in what position of life. So, for example, as a student, you can start with a very small one, and then you can grow your house when you get children and get smaller again when you get old. Um, and this is, this is how it, uh, uh, what the idea behind is. So there is a unit, which is basically 1.2 meters as a, as a unit. Um, a guy is buying it for, a, uh, for his student dwelling. He meets a girl. They get married, so they move together. And after they move together, they get a kit, the first kit. Um, then, then the house extends again because their mom uh, moves in and they get a dog, for example. And then the, the guy uh, wins an architectural competition, thinks he's the best architect in the world and builds, a muse uh, builds his office on top, way over-motivated and has to, the, the, the project dies, has to re-shrink to a normal size of a project, retires at a certain point, and when you get old, your knees do, don't work so well anymore, so you build a, a, a dwelling uh, for, without any stairs, so a pavilion kind of structure. <clears throat> so your house is not something that is all the time there, um, the same way and gets just less occupied over time once your kids are going to university or so, um, but can adapt to all different changes. And whenever you shrink it down, you can sell parts of your house or you can buy new ones if you want to extend it. Um, the main part of, of, of all uh, modular projects is the joint. Um, the most effort is always uh, into the main joint to develop a joint that works uh, well in the most easiest way. Um, it took us a lot of time, uh, over a year, to develop this joint. Um, and it's basically mounted then on the structure, the joint, so you stick the structure together, um, so, and then the structure, and then it has fillings. And all of those fillings, they can be uh, 
very different ones. Um, there's, there's uh, like for example, you have an iPhone, and then there are developers who, who create some app for the iPhone, right? Uh, the same thing can happen to here. Um, so you have your basic fillings like doors, uh, louvers, walls, floors, etc. Et um, stairs, for example, and then you can have different ones like Tesla batteries, uh, bicycle stands. So there is a lot of in industry um, f for people to develop then as a third party um, little fillings for the structure. And this is the base part, basically. It can come in wood or it can come in steel. Uh, you put it together as to the main structural element, the main beam. Then you get, of course, a little bit more beams, a, a close on the bottom, um, which is uh, onto the foundation, on top of the foundation. This is the main joint then. We are talking here about a size of 1.2 meter for each beam. This is the main structure uh, of the house, and then you basically add it up with different fillings. So solar panels on the roof uh, and gardens for your home gardening. Uh, <clears throat> everything of that should be very easy to build. So the main cost of houses are contractors, at least in Austria it is like this. Um, and the main cost, but also the main corruption happens uh, by hiring contractors and so forth. So to cut all this out, it should be very easy to assemble. It comes in a container, um, you pick up some friends of yours, and you can basically assemble it by yourselves and with your friends. Um, a little bit of a larger structure then. Uh, <coughs> uh, th this one is like a one single family house at, uh, now, um, with uh, one family house uh, with two bedrooms. Um, and uh, the main structure gets built first, and then all the fillings are coming into the structure. And whenever you, you, your life adapts or need to adapt to a certain lifestyle, um, you, can, uh, you can add again. And the bigger one. Um, I, I think that like, what we have seen in the last decade, for example, um, to telecommunication was pretty much revolutionized, right? With the phone, et cetera, um, the internet. Uh, at the moment, mobility is getting revolutionized by Tesla, by the Hyperloop, um, by Uber, for example, maybe flying cars into the future. And, um, I think that the main driving force of all of this one is collecting data. Collect data is, is our currency. But I think the, the most data is actually um, collected in the home. Um, so I'm pretty sure that if Apple or so is asking uh, what will be the next big thing, I think all of those tech companies are, um, are moving into architecture uh, pretty soon. So it might be that for them the next big thing is architecture. And I think all of us as a young generation of architects uh, need to be prepared uh, for this shift. And this is, might be one uh, project that combines then technology uh, with, uh, with our construction industry. Um, there is now a lot of movement in the smart home industry, but I think smart home is still pretty stupid. Um, but it starts to be really smart when all the components are interacting with each other, when all of them, they are influencing and communicating with each other. And this could be a first step uh, towards this direction. And now at the last point uh, for, my, for my talk, a very, one of my favorite ones, all the projects that are, talk, that, that are dealing with healthy architecture, vital architecture, um, are, the, are the ones to, that are closest to my heart. Um, that's my wife, Faye, um, in our yard. Um, we are planting most of the vegetable we are consuming by ourselves. We try to live autark. Um, we try to go just to the, to the supermarket for toilet paper, other necessities, but all the food uh, we try to produce by our own um, and, uh, and harvest by our own. We also got involved in a startup from our friend Niklas, um, he, has a, he has a pretty smart startup um, that grows vegetables uh, in the verticality. So basically all of these ones are ropes that are hanging into water. And after some times you can grow salads, you can even grow pumpkin out of that. 
Um, so you can have your vertical gardens also on a very minimum space. And I think there is a huge market for that, especially uh, in the south, where it also then a uh, garden can also cool down the building in a very natural way. Um, so this, these ones are the first tests uh, we did with this system. Um, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> this one is a is a farmhouse, a very traditional farmhouse in Austria, and I really like how a traditional farmhouse operated. So it had everything under one roof. So it has the stall in, uh, on the on the low and the left on the right part of the house. It has an in-between part where all the heavy machinery uh, was and all the working spaces were, and the living part and on the left side. Um, we developed uh, based on on this typology of a house uh, a little house in Germany, um, which is called Yin and Yang House. One part is for living. One part is for working, and the top is for planting your own vegetable garden. So you, the, as you see, the site is very, very small. Uh, when you build a house, then there, uh, you, there is not so much room with, uh, uh, with the car entrance and so uh, anymore for parking. So we planted the, 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 the garden then on top. Um, so one part is living and working both in harmony um, under one roof. You see a little bit the build-up uh, of the house itself. Um, so both parts are connected in the interior with each other, but you also can uh, connect to the other part then on its roof. Uh, the inside, and uh, you see the garden in, in, in summer, um, but uh, in winter it's also a good uh, time for, or a good slope then for the Germans to train a little bit skiing. Um, and here the garden on the top. Um, basically, uh, this is a very important topic for, for our firm. So how to connect food uh, with architecture. We are doing now a lot of projects which are just dealing with that. So this one is, a, again, a self-initiated project. So there, is no, there was never a client for this project. Um, but there was also never a client, for example, for the bamboo project that showed in the first, uh, as my, as the first project. Um, we just published it, and then afterwards we got clients who wanted to build it. So I think it shifted a little bit uh, the notion that clients are coming to you, but I think you also can take the initiative to get your own projects after publishing. Um, so this one combines, this project I show now combines this notion of how we can deal with agriculture on one hand and how, how we can deal uh, with architecture on one hand, because both of them are very insufficient at the moment, um, especially agriculture. Um, I, I will talk a lot about agriculture in a moment. Uh, so this one is a generic tower, let's say. Everybody of us as an architect is happy if a client is coming to him and say, uh, let's design a building like this. You are really happy uh, if he lets you uh, do a, a green facade. If he lets you do that to integrate gardens in between, you probably hug him. Um, but I think it gets very interesting if a building does that. So that, that our nature and the building uh, really live in symbiosis, and both can benefit from each other. Um, so the project itself started uh, as, an, as an answer to the refugee crisis uh, we had in Europe a um, couple of, yeah, two years ago. Um, so we wanted to build, made out of CLT, across laminated timber panels, um, very easy to construct buildings. So the triangle is the easiest way you can structurally construct a building. Um, the inside are living spaces, the outside are gardening units. Um, here you see all the modules that are, that are involved uh, in the further designs. So everything again is modular. You can extend it in every uh, direction. And this one, is the, this, this one is the base shed, a very small apartment for a refugee. It has then uh, refugees were not allowed back then in Austria to, to work for a living. Um, so they could work, for example, on their own home, though, um, as a gardener and maybe sell some of their vegetables to, uh, to the people, and there it, be, it gets already the first interaction. Um, as I said, it all, when their family, for example, then move uh, with them, you can extend it in, in every direction. So this one is a little bit of a larger one. Um, or with, green, with greenhouses for the winter. 
This one is already a little townhouse um, for four families. Oh no, this one is still for one family. Um, so not anymore a refugee home, but, uh, but something, uh, <clears throat> something more maybe for, for an urban environment. Uh, this one is a little townhouse, which, has, which is for four families already. And all of the families then have on the facade a lot of space to grow their own vegetable. Um, good benefit is also that uh, the green, of course, uh, is, is cooling down the building naturally. And uh, student dormitories. Where it gets really interesting, though, if you bring this idea to the high rise, to really to, uh, uh, to the verticality of our cities. Because I think that, as I said earlier, our, when we build a tower, they are, mainly, they are mainly islands in the city. So their connection they, they have to their environment, it ends at the doorman. And I think that is, that is very bad for, for buildings, how they interact with people on the street level. Um, Kimball Musk, I talk now a little bit about agriculture. Kimball Musk uh, said that uh, food is the new internet. And I can really relate to this statement because um, food is a $5 billion industry. Um, and there is a lot of problems with the food we are currently uh, consuming. And it continues like that. In the next uh, 30 years, there will be more food consumed than in the last 10,000 years combined. So I think that the current way that, um, that, the, that the countryside is growing the food for the city, that doesn't work anymore. I think the city needs to be part of our food production in the future. And uh, I think that um, this notion that we change that, uh, this, needs to change, uh, this, this needs to happen in our head. Because agriculture at the moment uses 70% of our drinking water. Um, it, it is a big threat to biodiversity because we are mainly growing corn world, worldwide um, to feed, to feed uh, cows so we can eat a lot of beef um, and to support our current lifestyle. So it's a big threat to biodiversity and it's just not healthy for, for our natural environment. And I think to make a change can happen first that we try to eat local that we try to eat regional, and if we, cannot, if we don't have the space for growing our own vegetables, then at least that we support local farmers uh, to grow their vegetables. Um, but I also think that as people, um, we need to take back the, the, the ownership of our food. At the moment, um, all of our food belongs to maybe uh, five uh, big, huge corporations, like. Monsanto or Nestle or, uh, or, um, uh, <coughs> yeah, or Bayer, for example. So all of those are big chemical uh, corporations uh, who own all of our food. But I think that good or real food is not a luxurious. It's not a commodity. It's a basic human right. So I think this notion that we have to take care of our own food, um, it needs to go back into our heads. Um, on, the, on the other hand, then also, if you plant vegetables uh, on your, uh, uh, in your private uh, balconies, it also cools down the building in a natural ventilation. It is, the city already produces a lot of energy. That means that the city produces a lot of heat already. And warmth is good for certain vegetables like tomatoes, nut trees, beans, uh, and so forth. And all of this one can then, the energy can be reused, basically, uh, to grow your vegetables uh, on the facade and to cool down the building. And in this way, also, the, 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 the building itself is not anymore an island in the city. It connects to the city because whatever is produced on the top of the building, it can be given to a larger community. It can be sold to its surrounding. So it's, the connection is passing past the doorman. And I think that is a very uh, beautiful way of maybe how we can uh, coordinate and, uh, agriculture and architecture and maybe both of those industries can benefit from each other. Um, I want to end my talk with a, uh, with, on a positive note, on a very positive note. So um, I, 
so I'm pretty so a lot of change I think is happening to architecture, um, and uh, this it it um, and it is a very exciting time actually to be a young architect. But I, when, when I was a student, it was not so excited. Um, and uh, I was a little bit overwhelmed by architecture. And I, I, maybe, maybe this example tells you why, and maybe you, a lot of you can find yourself in that as well. So when I was a kid, when I was very small, I got from my parents a little book. And it was a zoom out book. So it started with three triangular shapes. And then the next page, it zoomed out one, uh, one step further. And you saw that those triangular shapes were actually the rooster, uh, the, the comb of a rooster. And then you zoomed out one more step, and you saw that there are two, two, uh, two kids who are looking at this rooster. And you zoomed out, and you saw that actually it was just a magazine cover on the table of a guy who just had dinner. And it zoomed out with every page until you saw from the last page, you saw the... Um, you saw the, the moon, uh, you saw the earth from a moon's perspective. And I think that this is when you're studying, you see that, uh, you see architecture as well like this. So you see that you're being in an industry that connects the whole past, past of builders, all the tradition, all the vernacular, um, all its history, and somewhere there are you as a small uh, student uh, who is looking at all of this and are totally overwhelmed um, by, the grand, uh, by the grandiose uh, appeal what architecture has. And it's very hard to find your way in it. But I think the good thing is, or what I truly believe is, that real change um, happens in those uh, pages in between. So it doesn't happen on the last page. It happened on all these little pages in between. And this architectural platform, our play field, through new technology, through everything that is coming into architecture, is now so big to play, so everybody of us can find our own niche, our own little, uh, little page in this. And if we make a little uh, contribution or an innovation um, or inspire people on our little page, that might change then this last view where somebody is viewing from the moon uh, towards the earth. And I think that, um, that seeing architecture that way helped me a lot to guide, uh, to guide my young age uh, through, through our industry. Um, and I truly am excited now to be very young and an architect, and I still uh, want to stay as long a toddler as somehow possible, um, and my puberty can wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And now, it's time for the interactive session. Please raise your hands to pose your question. A mic will be brought to you. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I, before the question are coming, I'm taking a photo of you guys, okay? I link you then on Instagram. <laughs> Otherwise, if you guys have any questions, I'm also, uh, you also can post them on Instagram or so. I, will, I usually respond to, to questions, so I can also answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually don't don't think it matters what software you use. 
Um, I think all of the softwares are, are very, very good at the moment. You know, if you like one software, you can use those. Um, I think what, what is good to learn is Rhino because it is very international at the moment. I think a BIM software is pretty good if you try to find a job. Um, I, I never got really into BIM. We are, look, we are using it for a couple of projects now, but uh, you know, like mainly in China, so BIM is not that advanced yet. Um, but uh, as a Grasshopper and Rhino we use a lot. Um, for renderings, uh, we switch to Cinema 4D. Um, but this is just a preference uh, of mine. I've worked with Cinema 4D now uh, since 12 years or so, no, 15 years. Um, so I always worked it and I introduced it uh, into, the, into, into our team. Um, it's very easy to render, but the same, you know, 3D Max, Maya, um, they all can do basically the same. Um, so it's just a preference what you, what you like to choose. Okay, guys, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation and gracing this convention with your esteemed presence. Next is the presentation of Mementos. I now invite our principal, architect Samir Ilyas Kureshia, to present the Mementos. And now I invite architect Palinda Kanagara and Chris Pratt to receive our token of appreciation, gratitude, and love. On that note, on behalf of everyone present here, I wish Chris and his better half, Faye, a very happy wedding anniversary. <laughs> Wishing you both a lifetime of happiness and ever-growing love.